How's it, Ryan? Hey, Ryan, there's me, me Craig, Craig on post. <laughs> How's it going, my man? Very well, man. How's things in, where you in England? I'm in Oz. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Lekker, man. And you're in Miami, yes. That's flipping epic. You got the tan to to go with that, eh? yes. I wish, yeah. I have to use some sun glow here just to make myself look like. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. good. So how's things, buddy? Good to see you, man. Great to see your mug, Chana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I took that smile, <laughs> man. Yes, those, those teeth are white. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, how's how was the breakfast this morning and stuff? All good. Yeah, it was great, man. Caught up with your sister. Yeah, uh, classic. I introduced her to a friend of mine, Andy, and, uh, and then Depeche came and joined us for a little while. You were never, so you never really like hit gym in the morning, did you? You weren't like a morning gym, eh, hey, bud? You didn't enjoy it, or you didn't think you'd perform best then? Yeah, for a long time. I think when I really got into the whole, um, when we started working out with a lot more intensity and doing like CrossFit kind of stuff, this was back like in 2000 and maybe 2008, 2009. Um, I had it in my head that I was a, you know, I was a late owl. So I used to go to bed a bit later. I used to wake up maybe just, you know, an hour before work. Uh, and I always felt stronger in the evenings. And then that all flipped around. And then now I find out I really am a morning person. Much oh, cool. better. Nice. And with a higher intensity, it's great to get the workout to start the day. And then yeah. what, I want to be in bed by 9.30. Yeah. Past yeah. 9.30, yeah. You know, it's like... <laughs> It's, hectic, yeah. it's crazy, isn't it? Man? I'm a proper old value now. <laughs> I think we all, like, all of us are definitely a little bit more inclined to the morning, though. Like, I know Gareth is just a little bit the same. Yeah. I'm definitely the same. Like, it's just as you get older, like, it's just so much nicer to actually have like a full day to do stuff, you know. Did you just get married? Yeah, recently, but yeah, like a few you weeks ago. And then we were in, right? we were in South Africa. Thanks, buddy. We were in South Africa and Zim and Botswana. And it was epic, but we had like one of the best trips ever. Like it was so good to be home, eh? seriously. I hadn't been home for like four or five years. And what a place, man. The people, big smiles like yours. It was ridiculous. But, you know, it's funny. And, and Gareth and I have spoken about this a little bit. And now that we all three live in sort of an, you know, different continents and we all come from the same place, how South Africa has such an amazing energy about it. And it's difficult That's, to explain to people because when you rock yeah. up there, it's just, it feels different, right? It feels yeah, like it does. someone's just hugging you from the inside, right? <laughs> but, um, but I guess, thinking about it. yeah, you do, right? But I think yeah. for us now, it's almost like you look at it through rose, you know, through these like rose colored lenses yes. because we rock up there and we've got some dollars in our pocket and we're yeah. on holiday and everything, of course, is just better, right? So yeah. I think South Africa is a wonderful place to go and visit. And I think we're very lucky that we still can. Yeah, a hundred percent, my man. Yes. Yeah, I definitely. But 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 it's it is road. It is definitely rose colored glasses and stuff. But um, like you say, there's still Africa in general. Like what I've seen of it, it, it has got something. Like there is some kind of energy there that. Um, and I have actually thought about this a lot as well. Like, is it is it the rose colored? Is it just because we're from there, or is it actually different to somewhere else? And I, as objective as I can be, I feel like it's different you know what i mean but anyway who knows you know my cousin explained it well he said um when he moved to england for a little while he said you would fly back over and as soon as you hit like you know northern africa morocco he says the soil the color changes when you look at it from the, uh-huh. from the other thing. Ah, it's true it definitely yeah. has a different type of, of vibration about it have yeah. you got a little hesky there next to you no i got my water <laughs> but <laughs> um there's a teetotaler my man yeah, yeah. But i haven't had, I haven't had a <laughs> drink in like color. Flipping a year and a half or something. Crazy, eh? Not even one drink. <laughs> Nothing. It's incredible. Crazy, Good eh? For you. Good for you. Uh, nice yeah. nice it's not like, I don't know if it's permanent or whatever, but I just don't feel like, I just feel happy that I don't really need it right now. You know? Yeah. Nice, no, it's nice. great. I think it, it makes a huge difference, but like, I know when I go through patches where I don't drink during the week or I, you know, stay away from these big vendors on weekends, which, you know, we're living where I am. It's such a social, yeah. such a social <laughs> and all my friends love to get on it um, so it's difficult but when you do go through those patches you know of of, of cutting it back or not having it at all but it, it, it makes a massive difference does it, yeah, it does you feel yes, your clarity of thinking and your energy levels and it's just i think we've just come through this culture of drinking so much yeah, that we forget, yeah. you know yeah. before we started drinking how we should probably feel we'll i'll lead from there we'll lead from there and then we listen to flipping your story. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool, but it was classic, uh, buddy. Cool.
Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Ryan the Lion. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Mean Podcast. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, awesome, boys. Thank you so much for having me, mate. Honestly, I'm very excited about this. And um, yeah, I think you guys are doing such a wonderful job. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Cool, awesome. Pleasure, man. Yeah, no, thanks, man. So, you know, you and I obviously long time buddies we we went to high school together and actually our moms went to high school together as well which is rather crazy and like we didn't actually find that out until a few years after we had known each other um and one of the interesting things right about the podcast which i, I spoke to you about early on today was that i've i've realized that i don't actually know a lot about my buddy's stories like you know you kind of know the high level overview of who they are and what they are. But when you get into the kind of nitty gritty, um, you don't know like a lot about their actual childhood and the upbringing and stuff. So I'm super happy that we're going to have this opportunity to chat with you. We obviously spoke with Devin a while back as well. So i um, really looking forward to this, bud. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's true, bud. And I think, you know, it, it really made me think about as well, like about how little I know really about people very close to me or, you know, who are, I take as my close friends and family and yet you, you don't dig deep. You know, it's very mm -hmm. seldom that we have these deep conversations and ask questions and get them to think about or tell you things that they might remember or maybe have forgotten about their past. So yeah, it's power. It's definitely something I'm going to now take, take into my relationships going forward. And um, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. You just remember sure. you can't always record them. It's not, not always like that. <laughs> not, not huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it, I just wanted to say as well, like I always call you lion, right? And that's obviously, I don't know why. And maybe you can tell me now, like where does Ryan the lion come from? Like who gave you that name? Was it yourself or? <laughs> <laughs> but I think you actually really coined it and, and ran with it. And I think really? it was our trip to Peru. Um, obviously Ryan the Lion, I'm sure there's many Ryans out there that, uh, that will call himself Ryan the Lion. It's a good rhyming name, but, um, yeah, I think it was on our trip to Peru, but, and, uh, and then you suddenly just switched and it was, it wasn't Ryan or Ryan anymore. It was Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Well, I'm glad I had something to do with that, but, um, that's really cool. So, so, but obviously our podcast is about uh, understanding, you know, you as a person and you've got a, a really interesting lifestyle and, and you're a super amazing guy, but it will be nice just to kind of take it back to the beginning. So I know that your, your folks got divorced uh, when you were really young, like about one years old and you had to move in with your grandparents and, you know, the divorce is obviously a little bit messy. You obviously don't remember any of that, but you, you know about it. Can you just sort of take us back to sort of the beginning of your story and just lead off from there? Yeah. So the story goes, my mom and my dad uh, were married for a very short period of time. And um, my mom coming from a background where my grandparents, my, my grandmother was a school teacher um, and she was quite conservative. You know, it was uh, all about how would people think of you and you, know, you can't be having kids out of wedlock and all this kind of stuff. So very strict. And I think my grandmother said to my mom, you better marry this man. And so they got married um, and it blew up. So really i don't remember my parents together ever and i think i sort of my earliest memories was me living in my grandparents house in Bryanson. um and what had happened is my mom had obviously moved back in with the parents because they had a stable beautiful big home they had raised six kids um they were in a good place and uh and my uncle also lived in the house so really growing up i was very fortunate i had this you know amazing environment uh two great grandparents who were like older parental figures for me my mom and my uncle in the house and uh yeah so it was great and that was that was really my my memories growing up uh pretty much from the time i must have been you know one through 13 when my mom got remarried and we eventually moved out of that house oh cool man yeah it sounds pretty cool actually like you know a lot of other families in the world and other countries and stuff do live with grandparents and with with other family members and you know, it's almost like this clan of people that can kind of help each other out, which is actually kind of cool. So, and then, and not long after that, or later on, you actually um, ended up moving to Mauritius. And do you actually remember any of that? Or, and no. also like, why, why did you end up, why did you end up going there? In Mauritius. So what happened is my mom got engaged to a French Mauritian who was slightly younger than her. He was in uh, Johannesburg studying to become a farrier. 
So mm. the guys, the guys had changed the shoes on horses, right? Oh, and okay. <laughs> so they, they fell in love and he was this young guy and he came from a family that um, ran the, the, the turf club, the horse racing in Mauritius. Huh. So he said to her, you and your son Ryan are coming with me to Mauritius. So that's what we did. And we flew over there and we lived there for nearly two years actually. Wow. So I, uh, a chunk of my, my childhood was literally on the beach in Grand Bay. Um, we had this beautiful house and, you know, I do have these memories of us, you know, going down off the school to the beach and uh, having the run of this amazing island. That's nice. so cool, bud. And, and you mentioned that you, you like, you were, you were speaking Creole and French already and stuff. That's so, that's so awesome. <laughs> Isn't that crazy, right? Yeah, so I went to a little uh, nursery school there called Ecole de Nord. And obviously, you know, being young and your brain is just soaking everything up. Yeah, I picked up French. And, yes. uh, and then I was best friends with the maids, kids that lived in the back of the, the, the property that we were on. And I used to spend every afternoon there. And they speak Creole, which is this hybrid language of French and whatever else from, from the islanders. And uh, so, yeah, I picked up on Creole as well. And apparently, uh, Jean-Marc's brother would come in and he spoke Creole. And here I was, this little blonde-haired boy, rapping to him in uh, this mix of French and Creole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's classic. And you still speak a bit of that? Yes, but I call it nothing. Uh, <laughs> so so we, moved back, we moved back to South Africa probably when I was like four, four and a half. And um, yeah, and then, you know, it's like, it's like anything you learn. If you don't practice it and you don't yeah. use it, you just, it just fades into the background. And so unfortunately, yeah. I cannot claim French to my, to my repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. And did your folks uh, eventually remarry like on both sides? On both sides, yeah. So my, yeah. my old man did when I was probably probably like 10 or 11 and then my mom did when i was uh just before high school okay cool man yeah mm -hmm. so my old man yeah my old man's still married to his wife charlene they had a, another daughter nikki and uh and then my mom married brian he was amazing he was a great stable stabilizing figure also in my life um mm -hmm. provided a great home for us in four ways and that's when i went to the four ways high um so that house that you visited many times gareth was uh, of course yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Classic. Was, no, it was my home growing up. Cool, man. Nice. And you also were into a bit of go-karting as a youngster. And you know, what was that like? It sounds like so much fun. And were you pretty decent at it? Yeah. Jeez, but those, were, those were probably some of the best years growing up. Uh, we, um, we, uh, we partnered up with the Knezovich. So my dad was friends with his, the Knezovich, was, the Knezovich brothers growing up. And um, somehow, I don't know how they reconnected, but many years later, and Mark's son Dale was racing, and then uh, Mark turned around to me one day and said, "How would you like to race go karts?" So I was like, I "Would love this." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's how I started. And for three years, for three years we were sort of teammates, and we used to race together, yes. and uh, it was just great. And at one stage, yeah, pretty, pretty decent. I mean, I finished sort of. I think the best I ever finished was fourth in the national championships, um, and uh, got a good trophy collection to show for it. <laughs> race all over the country trips to cape town and port elizabeth and uh street races in umschlanger rocks and all sorts that was, that was fantastic growing up but yeah wow that's incredible what do you like yeah. on the roads these days man yes but faster faster <laughs> than ever <laughs> um, oh, classic man cool but and obviously you know we went to high school together we we met uh, i guess i guess on our first day we were in the same class and i always remember you being like such an academic guy, always full of energy. Uh, you always like to, to party, you had like this real fun streak in you. And we don't want to bore people too much with all our high school stories, but there definitely are like one or two that you know, it's worth sort of going in there. One of them, which, which definitely stands out for me and you'll probably, <laughs> you'll probably laugh when I say it because you know which one it is, was <laughs> when you um, made me drink a Fanta and uh, maybe, maybe, you can, maybe you can tell us a little about, about this story. <laughs> Use of it. Okay, so. Uh, so, so <laughs> that a guy would even do this to his friend. Um, um, so we used to, so Craig, to give you some background, we, you know, I'm sure it was the same in your high school, but you always had to <laughs> congregate with your same Chinas in a certain area. Yeah. That's your posi, right? But we, Gareth was famous for coming along and drinking and taking everybody's tuck, tuck shop stuff, right? So, <laughs> tuck, tuck, 
hey, buddy, what you drinking? Let me have a little sip, oh, right? Nice, yeah. So one day we sit in there and I had a Schweppes and you know, finished this thing and the guys were like, yo, let's play a prank on Gareth. But, you know, it'd be so funny if someone actually gets in the can and then, you know, if Gareth comes back, guaranteed he's going to ask you for a sip. <laughs> So the boys, you know, we spur each other on. I'm like, well, actually, I need to piss you on. That's quite funny. Let's do that, right? Yeah. So <laughs> all this stand up and, you know, pretending like nothing's happened and standing there. Oh, yes. True as nuts, but true as nuts. There he comes. Come down. <laughs> I'm like, boys, what's up? Lack of it. Can I have a sip of your shrimps? <laughs> <laughs> down a hook, line, and center. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So bad. How did he and respond? Up, Yes, this book, Gareth was upset there. Uh, Gareth, yes, you know yes. when Gareth is really upset and he just stops talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so definitely a bit of, um, a bit of, a bit of pent-up emotion. <laughs> but me, the, the story goes one step better because probably, it must have been two years later. I don't know if it was the same year, Gareth, but we went on our matric rage. No, but this was, this was five years later. No, okay. Yeah. So five years later. So you Dude. see how you hold on to stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. He, does, he knows to the day, but he knows to the flipping hour. He yes. will not forget it. Didn't let it go, right? Yeah, no ways. We go, we go on this rage and Bruce and I ended up leaving the house. I think we were spading some chick on the beach and the guys were inside and they'd started drinking and, uh, and Gareth had gone and decided that it was time for revenge and had gone yeah. <laughs> and laid his own trap in a bottle of like some kind of milky alcoholic drink that we had in the fridge. And Bruce and I came back and the boys were on the thing and they had cleaned up. Everything else was gone except this bottle of moonshine. <laughs> so Gareth pops up, hey boys, how you doing? Cool, we left you some drink in the fridge. Hook, <laughs> line and sinker, China. I drank that stuff. And I think I drank way more than you drank. <laughs> no ways, no ways. Because <laughs> yes. you were like, yeah, yeah, I've got to catch up to you guys now. And like, have a lot. And uh, yeah, man. Gareth was oh. the happiest man I've ever seen. Oh, I can imagine that. <laughs> yes. Uh, funny stuff, but yes. Oh, funny. Yeah. Those, those kind of stories, but are, the, are like, you know what? You'll laugh at those till the day you die. You know what I mean? Like, it's flipping hilarious. I love, I love when you're at school, how you, you flip and play tricks on each other and... It's borderline bullying, but it's funny when you're that age and stuff. And it's like, yes, it's classic. Right? Oh, we've always said, but in our group of friends, if you can't take, uh, if you can't take the banter or some mm-hmm. heat and laugh about yourself, whether it's the shape of your nose or your ears or something, but <laughs> oh, yeah. on you, you can't handle it. You can't stay in the group. Man. Totally, totally mad. Mad. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so taking it back, you were, you were after school and all that, you, um, you know, university was quite a sort of a de- defining uh, time in your life and um, you stayed on on campus for the whole uh, four years that you were there and you were sort of the head of the house um, uh, is that right and uh, what did what was that like and what was it like staying uh, on campus for four on years campus. those those are some of the best years by by a long way looking back at it you know being completely sort of uh, you know no real weights on your shoulder, you're exploring, you with a bunch of young guys that are all together in the same place away from home. It was amazing. Stellenbosch, honestly, is, is one of the best places I think a young person leaving home, segueing into real life could go to, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I stayed in, in what they call Corses, which is residence, um, in a place called Iandrach, and very Afrikaans, very sort of, uh, you know, deeply rooted in, in tradition. And here I was, this young sort of English boy from a regular high school in Joburg. I had no clue, but I had no clue of <laughs> how deeply rooted these guys are and how proud they are of tradition. So it was, it was fantastic, but it was a really good growth time for me. Uh, we went through the whole traditional sort of hazing that still used to go on. Um, and and being, with, you know, being with the same group of guys over the four years and then becoming seniors um, and then representing the house sort of on the what they call the Ha Kao, Hei Skumatia, which is like the prefectship of the house. Um, did that for two years. It was really good. A lot of fun. Sorry, but I interrupted you there by accident. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so, so yeah, it was, a, I guess, a defining moment. And I guess we all go through these stages, you know, these sort of chapters and, and, and segments of your life. And that was a great four-year segment. Um, I ended up studying uh, BSc Sports Science. Um, you know, growing up in high school, I'd always fancy myself to be a doctor. And I think I always told people I was going to become a plastic surgeon. That was my thing. Mm-hmm. 
And it's funny looking back at my life and I'm wondering like, why did I never become that right? And I'd applied for medicine at Wits and at Stellenbosch. And I got accepted into Wits and Stellenbosch I didn't. But they said, if you do a BSc degree in your second year, you can then segue into medicine. And for some reason, I just got so whipped up in the degree that I was doing. And uh, so I just ended up finishing that and never, never going to, to the medical side. Um, but yeah, I guess my life would have been completely different had it, you know, had it gone that way. So it's all yeah. been good. Yeah, for sure. No, because I mean, I remember you like always wanting to be a doctor. Like, and, and, and yeah, now that you said plastic surgeon, like that's exactly what it was. And is it something you, you maybe regret never doing? Or I mean... Do you ever think you know, about think, it? Yeah. You know, the stages when you do, you know, and you think, yes, I wonder where I would be right now, or what I would be doing. And, uh, but regret is not in my vocabulary, but I believe, you know, we all make choices along the way. And if you ever turn back and you regret something, then you lose your power in the moment, right? To move forward and to make different choices. And if I was that gung ho and really wanted to, there's nothing stopping me from going and doing it now. Right. Yeah, Other nice. than society telling you, Oh, well, you know, you've missed the mark. You should have done that in your twenties, which is, is bullshit. Right. But, um, but no, but like, if I think about where this journey has taken me and where I've been and what I've done, dude, uh, zero regrets, man. Yeah. No, no regrets. Uh. Yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> we like that. Yeah, actually, yeah, I actually could picture you a little bit as, uh, I don't know, have you ever watched the, the series, TV series called Nip Tuck? Uh, I have, I've heard of it. I haven't watched it. Oh, you got to check it, it out. You like, you like one of the blokes on there, I reckon. And I could, I could definitely see that. <laughs> and, um, so, so basically you worked uh, for a while as a personal trainer though in, in South Africa after uni and um, before you headed up to London. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened was as part of this course, so the BSc Sports Science course covers a whole bunch of stuff, right? You do all your, your science uh, subjects covering physics, mathematics, uh, biology, nutrition, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got your sports science subjects. And in the four years is built in a personal training course, right? Which is SACRA level six. It's like the highest personal training course you can do in the country. Mm. So I had that, but as part of that, you have to rack up hours. So when I came back to Johannesburg on vacations, then I'd have to go, you know, sit at health and racket club and do my hours on the floor. Um, so that's probably what Gareth remembers. Yeah. Many hours trying to rack those up. No, that's <laughs> classic. But I'm trying to remember was like, was that at Brian Park health and rackets or which one was it? Uh, I think it was at, um, what's the place? Lone Rock. Ah, Lone, Lone Rock. Rock. Yes. Okay. Flip. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that one, that one, well, it's now Virgin actually. Virgin, yeah. All of those yeah. clubs became Virgin. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. As we, we grew up in health and records, say eh, in back in the day, it was, <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely a defining moment. I think as well for a lot of us. Um, so, but yeah, you, you decided to move to London then you, after, you know, being a year or so in, in, I think in South Africa after your degree, um, why did you, why London? Like what was the sort of reason for coming here and, and how was that year for you in London too? I think for a lot of South Africans, because of our heritage, right? It's sort of a, uh, a rite of passage, right? That you would go and spend some time where your grandparents came from, et cetera. Right. So, uh, obviously you were there. Um, so I knew I had someone there. I had an uncle that was living there already. And then I could get a ancestry visa. Mm. So it sort of made sense, right? It was the easiest way to get overseas and actually be able to uh, have, a, have a piece of paper that would allow me to work and, and explore the place. So that's why London was sort of the, the natural um, path that I took for travel. And I remember growing up, <clears throat> the big thing for me was that growing up, my parents, you know, I mean, middle class, but didn't really have extra bucks. So we never did overseas trips. Um, and it was always a frustration for me that I wasn't able to go and explore this world that I would see on TV, right? And that I really wanted to get out and see. So in my head, I was like, right now, you know, I finally got the opportunity. I'm finished now with the university. Uh, London will be my springboard to the rest of the world. And I guess I had the intention originally to maybe spend the four years there uh, using my visa. Um, but, but yeah, plans change as soon as I heard about the cruise ships. But but yeah, you go back to asking about London and, and that experience. And that was a fantastic year. I mean, it was an amazing year. You know, I have plenty of stories and experiences <laughs> from, from that year. And I think it was almost like so much happened in that year. And I met so many people and we did so many crazy things that that one year period, and I think it was only nine months, actually. I think I rocked up there in March in the freezing piss cold thinking, what am I doing in this place? This place is hell. Um, and we had an awesome summer that year. But anyway, so nine months 
that, uh, that experience was phenomenal. It was great for travel. It was great for meeting amazing people. Uh, it's where I met Henrika. Yeah. So madly in love for the first time in my life. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. I even remember, so Henrika is a, a mutual friend of ours and, um, and an, an amazing, amazing young lady. And I remember Ryan ringing me up. He's like, uh, Gareth, um, cause you'd, you'd, you'd basically met at like a house party or something like that. Cause we were, we partied a lot in London now that I think about it. Um, and you, you had met at a party or something. And then you rang me like, I don't know, a week later or two weeks. And you're like, Gareth, I've got to, I've got to tell you something. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on a date with Henrika and I'm like flipping awesome. This is great news. <laughs> and then, and then you guys like you enjoyed like an amazing relationship. And like you said, you're head over heels in love, but then you, you've got this opportunity on the ships and you, I guess you had to make a decision. And I, I'm assuming that was a tough decision for you to make. Um, but it then led on to the next part of your life. Didn't it really? Yeah. So yeah, I guess sort of, maybe middle of the year, I decided, you know what, I really want to go and explore the ship's uh, opportunity. And I had a friend of mine that was a year ahead of me at university and he had just come back from doing a nine month contract. And I remember him showing me photos and saying, Rhino, if you really want to travel, have a look at this. And he picked up his camera. Mm -hmm. I think it was like physical pictures in those days. We didn't even have uh, cameras on our phones, right? <laughs> and he's like, look at this, but I was in the Caribbean. And then we went and we did the Panama Canal. And then I was up in Alaska. He's like, but there's so many chicks on board. You're going to have a jaw. <laughs> and he sold me this picture. So I was like, that's it. I've got to do ships. And obviously over that year, Henrique and I became, you know, really quite serious. And we literally, you know, spending every spare second that we had with each other. And, um, but I, I said to her from the very beginning, I was like, Henrique, at the end of this year, um, I'm gone. I'm going to be on a ship. So that whole process of, you know, going through the interview and doing the last couple of courses that I needed to do to get on the ship happened. And then eventually they were like, cool, you start your, your course in the January of the new year. And, uh, you know, Henrika was such an amazing girl, but so she knew I had this dream, you know, for selfish reasons, she would have wanted me to stay. And I remember coming home for Christmas and then going back to Sweden to meet her family and like a week in Sweden, just before I had to go to this, uh, this boot camp in London. And uh, yes, but that was one of the saddest, hardest nights of my life, yes. Tana, saying yeah. goodbye to her because we were in London and it was dark and cold and oh, all we yeah. had was each other. And we just had this like cloud of pending doom that uh, we were now separating. Yeah. And I remember getting onto that train, going to Watford, but and just literally with my head in my hands thinking, I hope I'm doing the right thing here, but... Jeez. And I got to the YMCA that they put us up at, which is a shit hole. <laughs> oh, <laughs> rock up, baby. And I got into the room and I literally burst out in tears. And I started it straight away. I was like, Enrica, I've made a mistake. You need to tell me to come home right away. I'll, I promise wow. you, I'm going to get back on the train. And she goes, oh, Ryan, for goodness sake. She goes, no, you don't. No, no, no Swedish accent. No, you fucking don't. She goes, she goes, you have to go on the ship now. She says, because if you don't, you're going to regret it and you're always going to blame me for that. Yeah. Wow. Wow, what an what a amazing woman to say that. What a woman, huh? At such what a, a young age as well, hey, bud. Yeah. Wow, wee, that's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yes, bud. Well done. I mean, she's, that, that kind of, it must have been so difficult, man. Wow. But but my, my uh, Chantelle's um, sister actually worked on the ships for quite a long time, and um, she's had lots of stories, and it can be pretty intense and hard work, and you know all sorts of crazy stories from there. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about what was your routine and the and the schedules and the and some of the travel. What was it like on the ship? So all right, so just just put ships in perspective. You've got to imagine this. Imagine living in a hotel, right, that moves around. And that you're living with the same people in very small <laughs> confines for nine months. Yeah. Nine months. But no ways, but yeah, it must be. period of time, right? Yeah. So at that stage, I was 24. I remember having my 24th birthday in the February and I got onto the ship maybe a couple of weeks before my birthday, right? Team of, I think there was 12 or 13 of us on that team. There was maybe 1,500 or 2,000 passengers on that ship out of Puerto Rico, San Juan. And at first, you don't know what the hell you're doing, right? You don't know how to get around a ship. You don't know what you're doing for work. 
you've got this manager, like bossing you around, you've got all this pressure, you don't know anybody. So at first it was like quite overwhelming, but very quickly, you know, you get into a routine and everybody's in the same boat, literally, right? <laughs> and um, so the first year's routine really was about jawling hard every night <laughs> in the crew bar with everybody and then making sure that you rock up to work on time with a really bad hangover. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that was really the first sort of six months of, of, um, of ship life for me. It was really like play hard, work hard, and trying to figure out how to do this job that you've, you've been given to do, which is really about sales techniques and learning how to you know, get people in in a short period of time and really motivating them to change their lifestyles and then you know, laying them up with great products to take home to hopefully change what they're doing. And I was terrible at it, mate. absolutely terrible at it for the first six months. Couldn't sell anything. My boss from you know, London would be on the phone every couple of weeks saying, this is ridiculous. The results aren't good. What are you doing there? And I guess, you know, it's all part of a learning curve. And um, six months later, I remember being in Alaska. And Alaska is known for like really good cruising. People that work on ships thrive for Alaska. It's really good money making wow. season. And um, the same supervisor, the same guy that actually motivated me to get onto ships at that stage had been promoted. And he was a traveling supervisor. So he ended up coming on board the ship. And I remember him sitting down with me and going, Ryan, it's so good to see you. Lacquer, we have this great catch up and a good laugh. And then he gets serious and he goes, you know why I'm here, right? So I'm like, <laughs> now we're going to have to talk business, right? And he goes, dude, listen, Results are shocking. He says, we need to change this immediately. And he gave me some pointers and it was all about stepping up in you know, the, the professional look of it. And anyway, the biggest thing I remember at that stage as a lesson um, was the thought and idea about money. And in sales, one of the biggest objections that people get is always about money, right? Try buy this. No, I don't want to buy it. It's too expensive. Mm. And the lesson there for me, which I use in all my sales training now, is that you've got to overcome your own objection first. And I remember him saying to me after six months, Ryan, how much money have you saved? But, and this is embarrassing, eh? six months working on a ship where we've got no expenses, you're earning commission, you can earn as much as you, you, know, as much as you want really. I'd saved $400. Whoa. <laughs> but $400 cash, that's all I had in my life, brother. And I wow. said to him, wow. very sheepishly, I said, but 400 bucks. And he says, okay. He says, do me a favor, go get your money quickly. So I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, go downstairs to your cabin and get your cash for me. So I'm like, okay, go downstairs, come up. And I, as I'm walking back up, I suddenly realize what this man's going to do. And I start freaking out. He takes my money, he goes through and he buys the products that I'm supposed to be selling. Right? <laughs> buys them, doesn't give me the crude discounts, takes the cash, gives me the product and says, now you must start using these. Huh. I literally was so angry and almost cried on the spot. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I had maybe, maybe 60 bucks left of my 400 bucks. I had these capsules and I had to start eating these things. But, but honestly, it was a game changer because the next person that tried to give me a money objection, but there was no way in hell they were going to <laughs> that they didn't have money when I just spent all of my money on the same thing. Totally. So, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, the reason I tell you that story is because from then on, but like literally my, my results and what I was doing in the company just went from like here and I wow. suddenly became the number one fitness producer in the company for that last period of, of my first contract. Um, what changed? Like what did you, you know, like, yeah. What was the change in the did or what? So, so sales is all about energy, right? And how you feel about something is how the prospect or the person that you are dealing with will start to feel. You know, that we're energetic beings, right? And as much as you try and hide it around words, a person feels. Mm. So when I was presenting and saying, hey, well, you know, this is only 400 bucks. I was saying it like this, but inside my heart was like, oh, it's so much money. <laughs> 100%. My guests would feel that. So the mental switch there was like, right, dude. You don't have the objection about money. It's only a number. Focus on the benefits. Focus on the result it's going to bring to the person that you're dealing with. And practicing what you preach, right? So now instead of saying to somebody, oh, you must take these capsules, thinking, geez, I don't even take these things. You know, it mm. was, oh, I do it. And if I can do it, you can do it. And yeah, that was massive. the biggest change for me. 
Yeah. What a smart manager as well. Like really astute to, um, to actually do it like that. And he, he obviously had been down a similar road maybe or something like that. Yeah, for sure. And the story he told me was like, Ryan, stop converting. He says, we're little boys from South Africa. We come with our rands. You're asking people in dollars. Don't convert it, mate. Of course, it's mm-hmm. going to sound like a big figure when you convert it. Uh, Don't stress course. it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wait, wait, can, I, can you just quickly maybe clarify what you were actually doing? Or like what, yeah, what so, were you selling? In? So personal training on a ship is, because you're dealing with people in such a short period of time, right? you have a number of different things you can do. Craig comes on board. He's a fitness buff. He wants to use the gym. Craig, you got a personal trainer at home? Yes, I do. Great. Why don't we continue that momentum? I can personal train you while you're on board. So there's services I can provide, right? But <clears throat> we specialize in educating people, right? So we do a host of seminars where we focus on lifestyle things like eating, nutrition, how you eat, when to eat, you know, basically build that component into your understanding. So hopefully you go home empowered and you, you look at your food differently. Um, a big topic for us is detoxification. So we talk a lot about where these toxins come from, how they affect the body, um, causes and effects of you know, high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, weight gain, uh, water retention, headaches, all these things that so many Americans struggle with. And we do these really powerful seminars that in an hour, I will educate you and hopefully motivate you to then come and spend an hour with me in a consultation. And in that consultation, I am going to show you what great products and ingredients and supplements we have in this line that goes down the roots of detoxification and maintenance for weight gain and health. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really where the, the focus of our business goes. So a lot of people come on board a cruise thinking they're just going to eat and party. And then they come to one of our seminars and they think, geez, and you know what? Actually, I've been neglecting my body for so long. Here I am. I'm on a ship. I actually have time to think about me. And here's somebody that can teach me and then give me something that I can use long-term once I go home. Nice. And that's the crux of our business. But I used to, uh, you, I remember you sending me the script basically that uh, you used for that, that, that hour long sen- seminar or something like, you know, you've got to make sure that you, you know, you're drinking water and that you're having like a fistful of um, proteins, carbs, fats with each meal. Um, it's the 80, 20 rule. And there were all these things now that I'm thinking about it. Like I reckon I've even still got the word document saved somewhere around, <laughs> around that. Yeah, but, absolutely. The zone diets and, and all these things that we, we, we promote. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's, and it's really interesting. And, and I have a lot to be thankful from you because you have like really disseminated like and, and shared so much information um, I remember like when we would go on holiday, like say, I remember the trip when we went to Thailand, for example, and uh, you and I met up for like the first two days together before the other Oaks joined and you like, you just downloaded all this information on me. you like, you know, here, you, here's this uh, Tony Robbins stuff. Then you gave me some NLP stuff. Then you gave me some Paul Check audio, which I've still got and I still listen to and share. Um, then you're like, Gareth, you've got to get this book uh, by Tom Masters, the mastering the art of sales. Like literally I've got so much to be thankful for you. You just, you're just like giving me all this information. And, um, I guess you got a lot of that from, from what you guys were doing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been the real blessing about my job, you know, is meeting people from so many different countries, all with these different backgrounds and, and different, uh, you know, different knowledge right and that's that's really what being human is all about it's about the sharing of this knowledge and um that's why i love i love learning stuff and then i love you know sharing that with people and making them aware that the stuff is out there and i yeah. guess at different times of your life it'll resonate with you and you'll pick up a book mm. and you'll be like geez and this is fantastic and other times you'll be like oh quite a difficult read um and there are books that you've shared with me as well i mean like that book the essentialism but it, like that really was a game changer for me um but yeah, no, it's great. Right? I've met some incredible people and, and this job in particular when it comes to health and wellness um, really opened my mind a lot uh, to what I was doing personally to myself, but uh, also getting me into the realm of trying to help other people. That's cool, man. And, and being on these big ships in the like massive ocean, that you must come across some hairy moments like weather-wise or, or, or does that never happen? And, and maybe you can, if you do have some of those moments, you can tell us about them, but also talk about some of maybe your favorite destinations. Cause I just look at your photos or, you know, and I'm just like, wow, this looks idyllic and amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is pretty incredible, but like 
So the Flotilla Hotel will leave a port and then for seven days or 14 days, depending where you are, we'll go visit, you know, four, five, six either islands or major cities, right? Um, and as a crew member, you, get, you do get quite a lot of opportunity to, to then get off the ship and go and explore these places and get a taste of it, right? Um, so yeah, destination-wise, I mean, I started in the Caribbean out of Puerto Rico, <clears throat> and we would do the Southern Rim, which was like St. Thomas, St. Martin, uh, places like Aruba, um, been to the Mediterranean and done that whole from Barcelona all the way through uh, Italy and France and Monte Carlo and all these incredible places. Um, the Baltic's also very cool. Stay a lot of Copenhagen and you'll see places like Russia, um, Estonia, uh, all of Scandinavia. So it's been fantastic. But I mean, in terms of destinations now, I've been to like 60, I think I counted 62 countries or islands uh, over the last sort of 10, 12 years. Um, and then the experience on board, but these things are so big, so big that sometimes you don't even realize that you're on the water. It literally is like terra firma. Um, <laughs> but there are stages, but there are stages where you've been, you come through some storms. And I remember once as a supervisor sailing, I think we we're sailing from Fort Lauderdale up to New York. And that stretch of the Atlantic can get pretty hairy. But we came through a thunderstorm one night and I remember being woken up in the middle of the night and the waves were crashing over the window in my cabin. Yes, so literally yes. it was just, you'd look out the window and just see lightning through water coming over the window. Yes, but, wow. And the ship listing at such an angle, but that Wait. everything that you had on cabinets, but was on the floor and yes, the yes. shaking, but this entire ship going. Jeez. Wow. And that was the first and probably only time on a ship that I've actually thought, you know what? this could get pretty bad wow but i've been pretty lucky i mean there have been accidents and stuff out there far worse but um but they're pretty good you know they, they know when these storms are coming through and they they circumvent or just change the route in and they get away from the storms as much as possible mm. yes that must be so scary i, I got to ask because alaska has always been on my bucket list and you said it was quite an epic uh, sort of trip or what was it like sailing around that area amazing oh man alaska the inside passage so the ships will normally go from seattle or they will leave from Vancouver. And then they go through this channel of islands called the Inside Passage, right? And but it, it's very difficult to, to sort of explain or to try and give you a picture of it with words. You have to go. Absolute must. If it's on your bucket list, don't even hesitate, right? Because mm. it is such a pristine part of the world still and so beautiful that you, you can never get tired of it. And I've done Alaska season quite a few years in a row. Mm. And every time I look out the window, you're just absolutely awestruck by wow. creation. And you just wow. get this sense of almost serene and everything just feels, there's a spirit. There's a real spirit over everything there that is just magic. Hmm. Wow. Well, it's certainly moved up one or two on the, on the bucket list now. That's for sure. <laughs> So you've obviously had loads of like super interesting experiences and, and uh, with all your travel and stuff. And, but there was a time when you were on your way home to South Africa and uh, you actually hauled off the plane. Uh, I can imagine it must have been a massive, like your heart must have stopped. And maybe, maybe just uh, tell us what happened on that incident. Yeah. So what had happened, this was the end of my third contract, right? So at this stage, I was like, I was really humming. Right, top of my game, really enjoying life. And um, finished, finished on this one ship and I was supposed to be coming home. So I was flying from San Juan and I get on this airplane. It was an Iberian Airlines. And um, we're on the tarmac and the plane's just starting to pull off. And the next minute it stops. And then there's a commotion in the front and the plane moves back forward and in come the security. And they start calling my name over the intercom. What? Oh, nice. <laughs> I literally, I literally, I literally shut myself. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I've done something wrong. Like, yeah. I, there's only one way the security of, and the, while they've stopped the airplane, I am in deep shit. And I'm trying to think what I've done. <laughs> anyway, as it turns out, they pull me off and I'm grabbing my bags and I'm all like in an absolute panic. And they make me wait there. And the next minute, the from Iberian Airlines comes over to me and says, no, 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 you need, to phone, you need to phone this woman from your company. They need to send you somewhere else. So I was like, what the hell is going on? Anyway, phone the company. And as it turns out, they were redirecting me. They needed me to go set up 
a project on other ships um, for another six weeks afterwards. So, um, so that was, yeah, that was a hell of a, Jeez, a little story and uh, something I wanted. <laughs> yes, I can imagine, but you must have been scricking yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what did the people on the flight say? They were like, yeah, they must have thought, Jesus, but Jesus, okay, yeah? like some yeah. kind of terrorist or maybe, you know, they just been busted, yeah. Oh, yes. Classic, man. <laughs> cool, but and then so so you obviously I think I spent you spent about four or five years on the ships, and then you decided to go back to South Africa, and you went back to South Africa to work for you know our, one of our best mates, uh, Brandon, and uh, he runs a company which like is a logistics company, uh, which which basically ties in with with another uh, business that he has as well um, that manufactures food and pies and all these sort of things. What was it like for you going back um, and also going from this life of travel to being in one place to working on ships um, and, and in big sales environments to work, work, working in an office? I mean, there must have been a difficult transition. So I think to just give you some perspective on that. So after I'd done three contracts, I, I got into this position of a traveling supervisor, which was basically on the road you know, every week on a different ship. So not even on one ship, I was a different ship every week. So you imagine packing your bag once a week, flying somewhere, getting onto another ship, new environment, new team, doing your thing and then moving. And I did that for four years after my first three contracts. Wow. So that was from two, 206 all the way through to 210 or the end of 29. And at that stage, the company was like, cool, we're going to give you your L1 visa, um, so there's, you know, you've got this idea that, okay, cool, promotion is on the rise and, you know, I'll probably move out of this realm. But I was so exhausted at that stage, just tired. I couldn't face packing my bag again. So I went home and while I was there, Brandon and I got into discussion about this business opportunity. And he had this idea of starting this logistics company off the back of his dad's pie, pie factory, right? So then the wheels get spinning and of course you have a couple of glasses of wine and you talk about, geez, and you know, this is an opportunity and two young guys, let's team up, let's make this thing happen. And I got really excited about it because at that stage I was thinking, you know what, it is time for me to hang up my boots. And I really do want to come back to South Africa. I've always had my heart. I always had the, the idea that that's where I would, you know, root in. So yeah, I came, home, I came back to Miami, had my friend's wedding, Tim, and then I resigned. Came back to South Africa. And I was ready, dude. I was like, cool, this is it. Settle into a house, get into this business and let's see where we go. So the transition, I guess, was relatively easy because the timing in my life at that stage was right for a change. Um, and because we were starting something new, there was never time to reflect and think, geez, am I on board? You know, we were, we were literally trying to grow the business, get new clients, grow a team around us. And the idea always was that I would, manage and direct a sales force, which was pretty much what I was used to and where my skills lie. So that was cool. Um, but like all things, right? If you are not doing something that resonates 100% with your heart and your mind, but you're going to start to feel resistance. Mm -hmm. And over the years, if I look back at it, we spent, I spent four and a half years there with Brandon building mm -hmm. this, this logistics arm, right? And Firstly, we didn't really know what we were doing. I mean, none of us have a background in logistics, right? We don't know the thing about trucks and maintenance and you know, the, the problems that you can experience when you have you know, tens of thousands of dollars or rands of stock out in the middle of Lady uh, you know, Nell Spray and the truck breaks down and suddenly the fridge isn't working and you lose ice cream and all these things, right? Had no clue. So we learned literally on the fly. So we face a problem, confront the problem, fix the problem, move on, lesson learned. And that was really what four and a half years was all about. But it was a constant fight for growth, a fight for making this dream come true. Um, so it was fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun, but it wasn't right for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember us having this conversation when we went, when we went to Peru. And I remember you telling me, are you happy? And I was like, yes, I'm happy. I'm loving it. <laughs> right? And that's... I guess if I look back at it and look at any situation I put myself into, dude, I always find that silver lining and I'm always going to focus on, on the good in things, right? No matter how tough it is and how much I'm struggling, maybe physically or subconsciously. And um, so, yeah, should we talk a little bit about those four and a half years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Cause, cause a lot. A, yeah, a lot of course. Happened, I mean, right? yeah. 
<clears throat> so in that four and a half years, I got into two major relationships along, along the line, right? One was with a girl called Claudia. Um, and then Megan, you met Megan. Yeah. All right. So here we are trying to grow a business and I'm literally committed a hundred, 120% to business, but we're waking up early. I'm the first one there with the boys in the warehouse, loading trucks, getting things done. You know, Brandon and I grafted hard. We would leave late, wait for the trucks to come home, 7 p.m. And that was, that was an average day, dude. Like literally bump and grind all day, every day, making this thing happen. Mm. So over time, right, that does start to wear away. You know, I don't care how balanced your life you think is, right? You're still exercising. You're trying to eat healthily. You have a relationship. You have a slight personal life. But the main chunk of your life is being drained by this thing that you are 120% committed to. And that was, that was our business at that stage. So in my relationship with Megan, right? And this is, I guess, a conversation I haven't really had probably with her properly, right? And it's only in retrospect that you start to look at your actions and <laughs> you ask yourself why I behaved a certain way or, or why did I take these, you know, these, these, make these, um, these things happen. But, over time, right, I, was, I became a zombie. That's, that's the only way I can explain it. There are patches of that four years I can't remember, dude. Mm -hmm. right? That I would have conversations with my mom over dinner, get in the car, drive home, and not even remember what we spoke about. <laughs> it was slowly, slowly, slowly wearing away at the nervous system, right? So I would come home to Megan, and in the first year and a half, everything was great. And then it started to get really difficult because I guess what was happening is I was becoming emotionally unavailable. I just didn't have the energy, dude. So I come home, get on the couch, watch TV, um, barely be able to make any decent conversation or take interest in, in, in her life. And that started to become a contentious issue in, in the relationship, right? Mm. So, yeah, but I mean, it was looking back, a lot of people ask me, would you, would you have done it again? If you go back, would you have stayed in America? Would you have gone and actually done that? And, yeah, I guess I, I guess I would have because there's a couple of very important lessons to, have, to, be, to be learned over that four and a half year period. The first one was <clears throat> you have to sometimes go with your heart, right? In fact, most you always need to go with your heart. That's the important thing, right? When, when this is telling you do this and your mind is telling you do that, always go with this. Somehow deep inside, I always felt it was not right for me. But the mind and my commitment was like, I've made a commitment. I promised myself to this. I'm going forward and we're going to make it happen. Right? So that was an important lesson for me. So now in retrospect, I start to listen to this a lot more. And in any decision-making process, it's like, let me sleep on it. When I wake up in the morning, how do I breathe? Do I breathe easy about it? And if you do, that's probably the right decision. Because that entire, but for the last two years I was in South Africa, I couldn't breathe properly. But I had like yes. a, hang a knife right here stuck in my chest and there were stages that i was literally hyperventilating and that was my norm wow bad. Bad. and that was literally my body saying buddy what are you doing you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing yeah, yeah. you know when you ignore that for long enough eventually the body just collapses right yes the other thing that happened actually is in a year after i moved back home brian my stepdad got diagnosed with cancer and within four months he died of malignant melanoma right um, by the time they'd caught it, it had metastasized to his brain and his lungs and his colon. And it was really, there was no chance of him surviving. So he died very quickly. And, you know, sometimes you ask yourself, was it divine intervention, right? Was there a reason already ahead of time that I was supposed to be in South Africa? And I really mm -hmm. believe that I was supposed to, because I don't think my mother would have really coped properly had mm -hmm. she lost Brian and I wasn't there to help support them. Yes. Yeah, so, for sure. That, yeah. was, that was an incredible thing, you know, because I was there just the right time during that moment in their life to help support and be that little rock for her. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, the world works in amazing ways, doesn't it? And you're so right when you look at it that way because your mom needed you, you know, and she, she uh, you know, I mean, I know your mom well, and, and without you, I guess it would have been, extremely tough for her and and and, and then that would have meant if you if you had stayed in america and you know you weren't in south africa you, it would have i guess then messed up you know what was going on for you in america so mm. the world has amazing ways of um showing us what to do that's for sure yeah for sure so yeah. I and also you mentioned in retrospect but like you know what i mean like 
oftentimes there's a lot of clarity when you look back on things and uh you know and when you look back on that and you can say well you know that was that was such an important thing and and what's more important than being able to support your family and friends so so yeah like it's the the being able to look in hindsight is is always very helpful you know yeah hindsight 2020 yeah yeah tell me about it yeah but and then obviously so so you then left south africa i guess uh, for your your second time and uh, you mentioned to me you had a bit of a, a nervous breakdown and you you know you suffered from anxiety and basically you just sort of pulled the plug on everything and you you, you just decided i've got to get out of here yeah yeah so actually that happened over a very short period of time i think it was like maybe beginning of june I woke up one morning and I just said to Megan, I was like, Megan, I cannot stand for going to work today. But like, I literally, I couldn't get my head off the pillow. I had zero energy and I actually just felt sick. It made me sick to my stomach to think that I'd, I need to, I'm going to continue to do this. And I said to Megan, something's wrong and I'm going to have to make some changes. Yeah. And at that stage, obviously we had been fighting. So, you know, <laughs> here I have a relationship that's on the rocks, right? Not enjoying it because we just at each other's throats the whole time really because I'm not emotionally available for her. So she's frustrated, right? Work, I'm clean. I remember go, going to work and just suddenly having this epiphany and just being like, this is not for me. Mm. Why the fuck am I still here? Mm. And I went to Brandon's office and I sat down. And I was like, Brandy, but I love you. It's been an amazing ride, but I have to stop. I am out of here. So whatever we got to do, whether we need to wind down or we need to get someone to replace me, uh, we need to make it happen and quickly. This is not a yellow thing. I'm out. So literally that was the decision to change. And Brandon took it very well. And he was like, okay, cool. But I understand it. And, and Megan and I had one more fight. And I said to her, Megs, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to pack my bags. I'm going to go stay with my friend, Chris. We're going to take a break. And I literally packed my bag, went over to my friend Chris, stayed in one of his rooms at his house. And over this whole period, I was suddenly like, right, I need to make changes in my entire life. Relationship is on the rocks. I need to get rid of that. Work, not loving it, I'm done. Then I'm on the phone with my ex-boss and best friend and just literally talking to him, sounding bored, telling him what's going on in my life. And he suddenly comes up and goes, well, dude, you know, have you ever thought about coming back to America? So I'm like, well, not really. I was like, why? He says, well, because, you know, our two bosses, we've spoken and, and they'd be happy to take you back. Why don't you come, mm. come back? So now I've got this seed in my head and mm. literally within the space of two months, but I wound everything up, everything, but wow. car gone, relationship gone, work gone. <laughs> I got rid of everything. I literally, my possessions, I could pack in a little tog bag and a briefcase. Oh. And I brought back over. But, and as, as rough as that was for everybody around me, right, it was literally survival mode. And I don't know how to explain it because it was, it was the most non-rational thing, bunch of things that I could have done. And, and, and literally dropping people, which, fuck man, it's not in my nature to hurt people to, mm -hmm. to drop them last minute. But, I didn't have any other way that I could see other than just get my head above the water so I could breathe and just start from fresh with nothing and nobody in my life. Wow. So that's what I did. I got an airplane and I came back to the States. I took my old position up with, and that was, and that was it. That was, that was nearly five years ago now, middle of 2014. Wow. But it's actually amazing what we're capable of when our, when we just align 100% with what we know we have to do. Hey, like, I mean, if you'd, if you'd said that someone could do that or yourself, that you could do that, you'd probably say there's no ways I could get, do all of that in two months, you know? And, but when you're like fully aligned, bang, you just get stuff done. And it's just, it's a big lesson. So other lessons, I mean, you, you basically, one of the things that you've taken and changed in your life, you, you sort of listen to your heart more um, these days Were the other sort of key things that you took from that experience that you sort of take with you uh, these days? Yeah. But I mean, look, I think it's so important that when you, when you put your focus and your energy, but it's got to be aligned with your medium and long-term vision, right? And don't create 
don't create the vision based on what you think other people want your vision to be. And that was always my problem for a long, long time, Craig. I'm known in my group as the people pleaser. I'm the yes man, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the guy that will make everybody happy, will you know, move around, come to an event, even when it doesn't suit me, just because I want other people to be happy, right? <clears throat> so I guess the big, the, that, that big lesson for me is what, is what is my vision, what is right for me? And to be able to say no, but it's okay. It's yeah, okay. Yes. You aren't going to be that offended if you say no to them. And, and that is still, you know, in the developmental stage for me because, you know, for so long, I was always the one saying yes. So, yeah, that, that was a valuable lesson for me, you know. And does it suit me? And, and sometimes that, you know, people are like, oh, but that's selfish. But I think in life you have to be selfish, bud. Because if you're not selfish and you're not happy, then how can you be in the right space to then, you know, make someone else feel good? So, yeah. Yeah, that's my thing. But I think it's all about now being the best version of me, making me happy so that you know, the energy I portray and can give is one based out of love because I'm loving me and I'm loving myself and I'm loving my space. Therefore, it's easy to share that love with you rather than having this inner turmoil on the inside and pretending to love you or, or be interested or do something for you. 100%. Yeah. yeah, that's so important, Pat. I think, I think people get confused when... People, when other people say, oh, you've got to love yourself first and, and all these sort of things, but, but you actually really do. Because like you said, if you don't love yourself, how are you honestly opening up yourself to others and, and giving them your true self and, and loving them like uh, as much as you possibly can when you're just like not happy inside? Um, it's such an important thing. Just take care of yourself first, seriously, and then, and then you're ready for everybody else. Yeah. For sure. Otherwise, it's just a facade, Gareth. And I've lived many facades, brother. Many. You know, I'm, I'm very good at putting on a character for people, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when during that stage especially, but I just had zero interest in the conversations I was having. That's why I wasn't retaining anything because I was had mm -hmm. this battle of the mind in my own head. So I was there physically, but not spiritually. And for me, I really want to be, I want to be there spiritually, but and connect properly with people. So the big thing for me, last year actually was trying to take a break from putting energy into, into, into relationships. Right. So it was all about being present and doing what's right for me and taking each experience with every group that I was in without, you know, getting excited about a girl and then developing, trying to develop a relationship and then getting distracted and then doing it again. It was like, right, Ryan, no serious girlfriends, no like, too much time and attention on one specific person. It's about you. Be in the moment, be present, be a good person. And that really helped me a lot. But in that full year of cycle, I suddenly came into this year being like, I think I'm now like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm open. And I have a much better understanding and awareness of, you know, the decisions that I'm making. And that's been great. Yeah. I love that. But I really yeah. love that. I've got a, I've got like a similar experience actually. Um, it was, when we met up uh, in, in South America, before I went on the trip as well, I was like, I am just going to try and be friends with, with everybody and like girls, you know, like I'm not going to try and like, uh, you know, be with chicks. I'm going to try and be friends with them rather. And, but it was the best thing ever. Like, like it's you liberating, just, but. It is, but you just made like amazing deep relationships with people and there was no like ulterior motives and you, you, you found out so much about yourself, you know, it was really a, a great thing to put yourself through. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, you had a whole six months of that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I guess it was, it was exactly the same kind of experience. It was like trying to shed all the bullshit and the story that you tell people and that, oh, you know, it's always, it's, of course, but it's always a game. Right, mm -hmm. be the friend, get in there. But what you're yeah, trying exactly. to do, is, you yeah. know. So yeah, going into to meeting people without an ulterior motive, but is so important. And but it's really yeah. you guys must have. You know, it's I think it's really valuable advice as well. It's like you got to know your values. You got to think about these things. Make the decision of what you actually want for yourself, like you said, Ryan. And then, um, and then you know, not just default back to the norm because that, like you say, that's the easy thing to do, isn't it? Like. The easy thing is just to like, you know, flirt and do whatever, but you know, to actually have known before the fact made a conscious decision 
and that's where the power is and then sticking to not not just falling back into the reverting back to the norm so you know like i really think you know anyone that actually does that i think is is um uh, quite a strong person and and also knows that they're trying to they're on a path of like growth you know so well, i mean well done to you both actually for making those decisions you know yeah thanks yeah. No, it's been amazing yeah. Yeah. Craig, you're talking about you're talking about lessons the other lesson i think is this and i think this is important for a lot of people out there right we live in a society where it's almost like chronological you need to do school at this age you need to be working on your career and meet your spouse at this age you need to be having kids by 30. You need to be living in a great big house and, you know, accumulate all this bullshit. Right? And something that I've realized, and especially during that stage, was it's okay to reset. Mm-hmm. It's okay. But at any age, if you are not happy with your circumstance, and you could be 60 years old, 38 years old, 30 years old, but press the reset button. It's mm-hmm. okay. You want to mm-hmm. let go of everything, start a new career, go back to school. Dude. There is nothing stopping you from doing that today so that the rest of your life going forward is really where you want to be, right? And I hit a little bit of a wobbly probably you know, a couple of months ago. I was suddenly like, I'm about to turn 38. Fuck. <laughs> 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 I've had all these amazing experiences, but really, what do I have like to show for it? You know? And I was like, oh my God, and some of my friends are doing so well. And I was like, dude, it's okay. It's okay. Calm the fuck down, right? <laughs> and and I'm playing this game now, which is like I'm 18 again. <laughs> like being 18 again. 20 years ago, I was 18. I was this young buck going to Stellenbosch University for the first time. Dude, I'm 38 now. I'm a young buck, still full of vibration and energy, but and I can do anything I want for the rest of my life. I love it. And, and shit, but that is so liberating. It yeah. doesn't matter, <laughs> mate. And stop worrying about what other people mm. think of you. Fuck it, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't yeah. matter. What do you think about? That's important. <laughs> so, I love it, man. So powerful, you know, it's awesome, but it's a whole adventure, right? And and if we could just take more adventure out of every day and say, you know what? Cool. That's where I want to go. Change, pivot, and go for it, bud. Go for it. I love you it. Know what? If it doesn't happen for you in this life, it'll happen in the next life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's time, <laughs> bud, because our spirits are transport. They will continue, bud. Right. This is not the end. <laughs> Physical body we're in right now. It's an experience, bud. Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm with you on that one, but for sure. I actually got goosebumps just list, think, listening and thinking about that. But, it, but it's, it's exactly, Flip, Craig and I talk about this all the time. Like, seriously, right now we know that, that all we've got is from now until we die. So you just have to make the most of it. Stop fearing stuff. Stop thinking, stop worrying about what other people think. Do stuff that makes you happy and flip and go for it. And, and, and do that every day, like you said. Don't hold back. Just do it every day. Yeah. Shit, yeah. You know, that's why I love that. <laughs> I'm getting so excited right now because you, know, you guys have been so inspiring watching you guys and just putting yourself out there and just being you. It's so refreshing. It's so refreshing. But it's like, you know, yes. if you've got this thing going and that makes you laugh and that makes other people laugh, fuck, it's so good. Man. We take ourselves way too seriously. Yeah. The whole thing yeah. about... Yeah, I don't know, but it's just, it's great, man. It's just good to have this almost like a, a realization, but and just be like, right. all good. It is all I'm good. Not, Life is I'm great. Lost. Exactly, but <laughs> it is great, but and, and I lost uh, our, our previous guest, Richard Mulholland. He also spoke about like, what are you going to be remembered for? You know, like you, you don't like for me as a chiropractor, you know, it's very easy for me to identify with that in my life and everyone identify me as that. But then by, by going through this process of the podcast and, growth in that aspect and you know having the support of gareth and you know all these things and friends around me like you don't always you don't have to just stick to that one identity your whole life like and it is liberating you're like it's okay to like change and pivot in your life as well just like you would in any other thing and it really i think is you hit the nail on the head it's a liberating feeling to know that it's a lot of that is is worrying about what other people think you should be doing and and by not uh, allowing like that influence in your life yes man like I, it's so cool but right? so yeah thanks for that advice and just the reiteration it's it's really good so i think you know one more thing on this topic right so i always try to understand why why i was a people pleaser because gareth you brought this up in the storyboard right and growing up with divorced parents i think is really what made that happen because 
whenever there was conflict between my mother and father, let's say over the phone, and they were fighting over whether I was allowed to go to my dad for the weekend or something, right? I always wanted to avoid that kind of fight. So I put the pressure on myself to try and be the perfect son on both sides to make life easier and happier when I was with them, right? So I would go along to my dad for the weekend and I would do everything to please my dad. I can sweep the pool, play with the younger sister, even when I didn't fucking want to. I would because I knew it would make things happy and it, would, it wouldn't create any kind of conflict. Then I'll go back to my mom for the week, same thing. Be the good grandchild, be the good son, da 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 And then that subconscious training moves on in other aspects of your life, right? Mm. But yeah, that liberation would have suddenly realized, hey, buddy, you don't need to do that. You do not, you're not responsible for other people's happiness, man. Yes, yeah. Mate. That's yeah, massive. Totally, totally, mm. man. But maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit about what you actually do now, because I, I guess I, I, I don't necessarily know that for sure, but I would love to know what you do. So right now, my title is uh, Director of Operations, right? So we have 18 different cruise lines. And on each cruise line, you have anywhere between six ships to 25 ships. <laughs> so my role right now is I handle and direct four different cruise lines. Uh, we've bundled them into what we call a luxury umbrella, uh, higher scale uh, cruise ships. And I manage the day-to-day -day operations for each of those vessels. So imagine having uh, 21 businesses operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week in different areas of the world. Hmm. Each of those businesses has a spa manager and a team of anywhere from five to 50 people on board a ship. Um, so my role really every day, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that the ships are fully manned. There's the right staff being moved around, coming back, leaving. Um, I direct the managers and converse with the managers daily about their results. Uh, about hitting their targets, about demand management. Um, I liaise with the cruise lines themselves also on special projects and making sure that they're happy with the service that we're providing them. Um, I'm in charge of uh, sales training for our team. I manage a, a supervisor that is my, my Ray Donovan, I call him. He's the guy with the baseball bat. That when there's a problem, send him out to the ship and <laughs> get him to the um, so it's a great, it's, it's such a fun job because every day is different and you know, you can't write a script for it. It changes every day, but it's, it's very rewarding. I've got 255 staff that are under my care um, that, uh, you know, I can, I understand where they're at because I've been on the ships. I've worked in these teams. I, you know, I can empathize with their problems and I can show them ways and, and, and means to, to become better on board. Um, so and that's my job at the moment. Cool. And you're still solving some problems like the broken down truck in Nelspreet that uh, you, know, you still have to solve. <laughs> Never, <these other things. laughs> no, no, thank God, thank God. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, hopefully as a chapter I'll never have to. Do. <laughs> but some of the skills you've taken from like having to figure stuff out as you go, I guess you're always going to use in ah, other businesses, you know. Craig, I tell you what, mate, that school, and I call it school. It was a four and a half year school that you cannot pay for, but. You know, when you're dealing yeah. with these kind of problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but it, it really does, it builds a <laughs> skill set and an ability to absorb pressure, but that uh, you, you can't pay for. So yeah, the skill set operationally, uh, thinking outside of the box, dealing with issues as they happen has definitely uh, made me better and stronger for the position I'm in now. Yeah. So yeah. talking about some of skills, like the, there's obviously a massive uh, uh, skill set and a lot of science and, and psychology uh, uh, behind sales. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the art and science of, of sales. Uh, sales? As you said. Yeah. <laughs> Firstly, I love sales. Sales <laughs> is the most amazing thing. <laughs> and I always tell my staff, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I didn't realize I was going to have to sell. And I was like, buddy, you've been selling since you were three years old. <laughs> when you went to the store and you asked your mother if you could have a sweet and she said no, you were a poor salesman. <laughs> you didn't get what you wanted, right? But slowly you That's figure funny. these out and you realize that your parents have little buttons you can push and ways of saying things to get what you want. What do you think that is, mate? That's an exchange, right? So sales for me is all about exchange and it's an exchange of energy. And this is something that I bring into my training a lot, right? So yes, it's psychology. It's understanding uh, a certain personality trap and, you know, are you analytical? Are you more emotional? Uh, what kind of triggers can I press or identify in you when I'm sitting face to face with you, right? 
but really it's all about energy because sales is a human to human interaction, right? You've got something that you want. I hope you have that thing that you want and I'm going to exchange that maybe for money or maybe for service or whatever it is, but it's an exchange. And one of the things I try to get my staff to understand is that money is really energy, right? So it has an energy. We think about it. We, you know, we worship it. We exchange it all the time. And all you're doing is you're changing the energy, right? So you want to get money from a guest, but what are you going to give in return? And our therapists and you know, most people out there either have a good service or they have an amazing product to exchange for that money. So yeah, sales is all about that. It's learning how to bring that exchange in a natural way by listening, identifying, really getting inside of your head so I know what it is you want. Because if I'm trying to sell you something that you don't want, it's going to come mm-hmm. across as pushy or you're just going to walk away from the whole situation, right? But if I know what you want and I can figure that out, then hopefully, you know, if we're in the right space, I've got that, I've got that thing that will give you the results that you want. And, uh, and it's exciting, but because it's like a little challenge, right? Every, every human being is like a little puzzle piece. It's like a Rubik's cube. <laughs> You've got to figure out what makes them tick. What are their interests? What do they like? What don't they like? You know, what should I be saying or doing? Or, you know, it goes as far as body language. You know, the NLP, Gareth, that we, yeah. that we speak about is all about body language. But, you know, it's like people like people who like themselves. So <laughs> if, you sit, if you sit opposite me and you've got a big smile on your face and I'm sitting there grumpy pants, clearly we're not going to connect, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, simply open my eyes a bit, put a big smile on my face, and right away you're thinking, shit, this guy's quite cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so um, true. Yeah, yeah but there's, there's a lot to it. You know, there's a lot of nuances when it comes to sales and there's a lot of things you've got to think about. And if you do it repeatedly enough times, then you become good at it because you learn how to move naturally and identify things without overthinking it. And you can just dance with them rather than fight them. <laughs> you sound like Seth Godin. He said something about uh, dancing with something when he was on our podcast recently. So. Uh, how, was, <laughs> yeah. how was that? I was actually watched that. Was that a... That must have been a very interesting conversation, huh? It was, but it was it was kind of daunting actually speaking to him, you know, because of I guess his profile and stuff. But it was it was an, it was an amazing chat. I mean, he was just like, I mean, he doesn't mess Machine. around though. That's for yeah. sure. He does not mess around with uh, with his chats and stuff. But but it's super. Just just I mean, you know, really nice guy. So glad that we got got him on the podcast. That's for sure. Um, but but just something that which for me uh, is comes across as you know like a real natural way of how you are and how you do things is being a leader and bringing people together obviously so how do you get your teams going on a daily basis like what what is what are the key ingredients to being a good leader and bringing a good team together <clears throat> i think firstly your own attitude is important because when you're leading a team when you step into a room with the team you've got to bring the right energy with you right? If you want your energy, if you want the energy to be good and positive and upbeat in a team, you walk in without that energy, forget about it, right? Because it's infectious. So for me, the first thing about a leader is you've got to have your own shit, right? You've got to, you've got to be in the right place mentally and spiritually if you want to lead a team in the right direction. Then it's about sharing a vision, right? So my teams know very clearly what their expectations are, right? So we either talk about numbers or we talk about, you know, certain goal parameters that we want to achieve. And we've got to make sure that we're on the same, we're on the same page and that we're both looking forward at the same thing. Because if one of our managers ideas is different to mine, let's say we're talking about dogs. Okay. We can do this experiment quickly. This is a, a good, a good way to look at it. So if you think about a dog, you've got a picture of a dog in your head. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Bull terrier. Bull terrier. Craig, what's yours? Sausage. A sausage dog, right? <laughs> it might be a little Jack Russell. So, we're talking yeah. about the same thing, but we've got three different pictures in our head. Our visions aren't aligned. Yeah. Right? So how can I lead you if you're thinking about a pit bull, you know, and you're talking <laughs> about a sausage dog, you know, clearly something's not going to work together there. So for me, it's all about the vision. We've got to make sure it's very clear that we're talking about the same thing and we both want to achieve the same thing. Then it's easy to lead a team, right? Because you're walking in the same direction. Um, then the other thing is, for me, communication is key, right? Tell me how you feel. And a lot of times my managers will phone me and all they want to do is vent. Mm. So I think as a, as, a, as a leader, you've got to be willing just to listen. Mm. Right? Let them vent, let them cry, let them call you names. It's okay. 
Because once they've got it all out the system, and you tell them, I hear you, I understand your frustration. Mm. However, mm. you've got to come back to task here. Right, number one, is there anything I can do for you right away to make you feel better about the situation? If not, what can we do to actually change it and make it better? But, and, and, and that's, it goes a long way, mate. It goes a long yeah, way. Yeah. If you can't be autocratic, you can't be dictatorial, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get on a human level with them. And for me, my style of management is very different to other people in the company. You know? uh, other people are a lot harder. Um, I tend to be a lot, I guess some people would call me soft, but I don't think it's soft. I think it's just being me. And yeah. one of the things that's helped me, especially over the last year, and I think I've been pretty successful, is just don't put on a persona. You know, I'm yeah. in this position. I've been given this position. Clearly, I've done something right to get here. Don't yeah, try sure. to change it or put on a persona because I think that's the way it should be done at this level. No, but be me and be the best version of me and things will automatically go in the right direction. So, oh, okay. yeah. Very good, man. And uh, so, I mean, obviously, once again, you've had so many great experiences, but what, what has your experience been like living in Miami? Craig, Miami is an amazing place. An amazing place. <laughs> and it's had, it's, had different, it's had different appeal over different times in my life. You know, when I was 25 and I came here for the first time, Miami was exciting because it was so many parties and so many beautiful girls and so many like, you know, things that a young 25 year old male wants to do. So for that reason, it was amazing. Now I'm 38 and Miami is amazing because it's beautiful. The weather's always great. You always feel warm. Uh, there's lots of water around. I appreciate the beach and the water and looking at the intercoastal and going paddle boarding when you want to. Um, and, and now I'm starting to really anchor down and, and develop a friendship circle for me. So uh, living in the area that I do here on South Beach and Gareth and Craig, hopefully you guys will come visit me one day. Um, sure. We have a really cool little community within like a four block radius here on Miami Beach. And everybody that lives here works here generally. And you'll either see each other at the restaurants or you'll be working out in the same boutique gyms um, or you're at the coffee shop and you bump into each other. And, and that for me has really brought Miami to life is, is, is bringing nice. a nice circle of friends. And yeah, and that always makes the city more enjoyable. It doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. Sure. community yeah. yeah yeah i think i've i've been to, i've been to miami twice and like both times i've been like wow this is a pretty cool place to live definitely yeah. so i definitely have to come and see you there that's for sure it'll be another level yeah. um but there's things that you and i have like so much in common with and like we like to talk about uh you know so many stories and and, and life and fitness and these things and there's there's you know, law of attraction is something we both have a lot of interest in. We have a friend, of course, Gareth Pickering, who, who, who runs that as a business, um, basically uh, focusing, you know, he helps people with law of attraction and, and coaching around that. But you have a cool story that you said you would uh, oh, like to yeah. share with us. Yeah. <laughs> but the law of attraction is mind blown. Absolutely mind blown. Right? So I want to share with you just quickly two things. So number one, I always wondered why America had this sort of magnet attraction, right? Why have I ended up coming back here twice in my life? And it suddenly dawned on me that throughout my entire high school, I had an American flag hung above my bed. Huh. So every day, every night for five years, but I would go to bed and the last thing I would see is an American flag. And the first thing I would wake up to is an American flag. And now as I look out my window, there are American flags all around me. So, Wow. If, first, if a person tells you that subconscious training doesn't work, hmm. <laughs> they, they don't understand it, right? So that was the one thing. Then what happened is in 2016, um, end of 15, I, I'd actually met up with Gareth Pickering in, back in South Africa. And he recommended this book, uh, The Miracle Morning, El Halrod. Hmm. And in there he talks about you know, your morning rituals and doing your six things from your affirmations, your writings, uh, uh, reading and exercise and all the stuff. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to make a real conscious effort to do this religiously every day. Wake up at 5 a.m. First hour is all about the miracle morning. And as part of that process, me and my housemates, we made vision boards, proper big board, pictures, etc. And as we were doing this process, I was reading the Miami magazine and there was an article in there called The King of Miami Beach. And he has a guy standing on the back of his boat with his arms outstretched, this massive smile on his face. And the name of his boat is Groot. <laughs> <laughs> so I read this and I'm like, who does the schmuck think he's the king of Miami? And it's a guy, 
it's a guy called David Gruttman. I'd never heard of him before, but this oak is the king of Miami Beach. Great story, <laughs> great story of his rise into like the high echelons of club owning, restauranteering, uh, business connections, etc. And I dig the picture and I thought, this oak lives life the way I want to live life. So I cut this picture out and I stuck it on my vision board. Every morning, every morning, doing my morning ritual, looking at this board. And February, it was not even six weeks later, but I come home from a, from a ship visit and my housemate says to me, Ryan, it's your birthday. I want to give you a birthday present. He says, but it's not a physical gift. It's an experience. So mm -hmm. I'm like, cool, what are we doing? Think we're going to go go-karting or something, right? <laughs> and we, we walk down and we go across the street and we walk into this, this little suburb over here called Sunset Isles. And there's some massive houses there, but like really liney, big, on the water, boats outside, cars, crazy. And we walk into this property and I'm like, Depeche, like whose house is this? What are we doing here? He goes, you'll see. So he knocks on the door. The door yes. opens. It's David Grutman. No, no way. <laughs> So I'm standing there absolutely gobsmacked, but I'm like, and he goes, hey, how's it going, guys? You must be right. He says, I'm David. I'm like, I know who you no are. I've been looking at your fucking picture for the last six years, bro. <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, I that has made it like this. You couldn't ask for a better, more down-to-earth host. China, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know Depeche, and I'll tell you how they met. But he welcomes us into his house. He introduces us to his wife the people that work for him. He sits us down to drinks and lunch, shoots conversation like he's known me for years. Yes. Then he says, so Depeche tells me you have a vision board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes. He says, and on there, I know the picture. He says, I did that, I did that shoot for Miami Magazine in the article they did. And he says, there's my boat. And there's his boat docked alongside on the canal. No and he says, come, let's go for a drive. So we yes. go out to his boat, right? Tells us his whole life story. Amazing guy. We come back in and as we dock in, he turns around and he says, so I guess you need a photo. Yes. So there I am on the back of his boat, arms up, stretch, but identical to the picture in the magazine. No ways. That's, right, that's classic. classic. Oh, cool, awesome right? Story. Yes. So I, this is how it happened. By chance, but Depeche had met him maybe a week before at the gym that we go to. David had walked past. Depeche recognized him. Said, hey, you David, da, 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 da. you don't know me, but I've got to tell you the story about my, my housemate. <laughs> but, and the oak literally pulled out his card and he said, Call me when he gets here, we'll make it happen. Wow. How's, that, oh, how's that for a champion? Right? Story, man. The story gets better. On this board, <laughs> I've also got pictures of Monte Carlo right, and Formula One Grand Prix. And my entire life, I've wanted to go to the Formula One Grand Prix in Monte Carlo. Obviously, as a kid racing go karts, it was always something you, you, know, you looked at Formula One. And so I've got these pictures on my board and I'm not joking, probably about another six weeks after the David Grafman scenario, my boss says to me, Ryan, your one fleet, all the ships are going to be in the Mediterranean at the same time. Great opportunity to see the entire fleet in a short period of time. See if you can make it happen. So I go into all the itineraries and I'm looking to see how I can move easily between these ships and they all line up. Like literally Barcelona to Barcelona, Rome to Rome. I can see four ships in the space of four weeks. Fantastic. Yes. And then I start looking at the itinerary. First ship, Monte Carlo. Second ship, Monte Carlo. Third ship, two nights in Monte Carlo. Yes. That's pretty cool. Put my request in. They all get approved. And this cruise line is very difficult to sail on because they're so small. They're always fully booked. Approved, 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 approved. Yes. Two days in Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo Grand Prix. I was no way, watching the Grand Prix, but I spent a, a full two days, the entire weekend there. Wow. No Monte ways. Yeah. Power That's piece. amazing, bud. That's oh, you can't write that, but like, how do you, you, how do you explain that? No, exactly, bud. Yes, that's amazing. <laughs> and does, does uh, Pickers know the story? <laughs> He's going to flip it no, over. No, I haven't, I haven't told him. <laughs> we need to have that conversation. because it's Oh, it's epic, man. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, that's but, freaky. <laughs> and man, you, so so you spoke about like you know your morning routines and that, and and apparently you always have a little notebook and a pen with you. Is that something that you kind of picked up from someone, or is that just something that you've kind of always done? And why? So I remember listening a lot at one stage to Jim Rohn. Mm. You know the guy? Yeah, right? yeah. The Jim Rohn was actually a mentor of Tony Robbins. Back yes. in, he's dead now, but the way he speaks really resonated with me for a long time. I love listening to his seminars. 
And I remember his one saying, you can trust a lot of things in life, but you cannot trust your memory. <laughs> so wherever you go, take a notebook with you to make notes because how many great things do you hear? Inspirational moments do you have in your life that you should write down to come back to as reference for later? And ever since then, I've carried a little notebook and I try to take notes whenever I'm reading books and anything that, that jumps out of me, I'll write down because I find it invaluable sometimes, you know, just to go back through it and pick up these gems that yeah. you can use either when you're talking to somebody, maybe for inspiration or you're doing a training and you need something to work with. Um, yeah. So yeah, I highly recommend it, but I think taking notes is, is definitely um, underrated and something that uh, is, uh, I found very useful in my life. For yeah, sure, but. totally. For me, one is one is one of the most powerful things in the world is 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 writing. It doesn't mean it matter what you're writing, if it's uh, like just your thoughts or if it's goals or whatever. Just write them down because, like you spoke about the subconscious, like that stuff starts becoming reality. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah so, and, and also, like you, you spoke about Seth. And, sorry, but carry on. I know you spoke about Seth a moment ago, and and he also spoke about. Um, you know, he has all these interesting stories and when you have, I think when you've set yourself up like with a notebook, then you're more inclined to be a, a better listener for things that might be interesting. So you, you're kind of setting yourself up to win uh, and hear those kinds of things because you already know, sweet, if I hear something good, I've got it. Mm. And, uh, and so you actually end up listening to people, people in a bit more sort of a present way, I think, because you have your notebook in a way, which is a weird Thing I'd never yeah. thought of. Like you really set cool. yourself up to be a radar, like to pick the stuff yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You're totally like aware of it and you're sort of waiting for those, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, it's crazy yeah. because you can think about how many interactions you've had or how many things you've seen and you've maybe just completely missed something amazing that could have, exactly. could have helped you along the way. Uh, or you'll think you'll remember it later, but there's yeah. no way. You know? you never, five minutes no later, damn it, what was that thing that yeah, we said? Exactly, so good, man. Man. <laughs> totally, totally, man. Exactly. Yes. Um, I, like, I, mean, I know we all listen to a lot of podcasts and, and literally every day I listen to a podcast. And I'm like, yes, there's so much good stuff in here. And then I'll be like, okay, cool. I remember this. And then I write it down. And then, uh, then I'm, I forget about it. You know, and like I, oh. I literally reckon, and I'm actually going to seriously start doing this. Like, you can create almost a business, like if it's even just a blog or something, but every day you listen to one podcast and you're like, I'm just going to write down the really good things that come out of this podcast. And you do that. Even if it's a 30 minute podcast, whatever. Mm. And you publish that every single day, you will build a oh. business. Do you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and a knowledge bank that's amazing. Incredible, but that, that yeah. would actually really be good. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, buddy, like, look, we're coming to the end of the chat. Unfortunately, you know, it's been so cool chatting with you and, and we both know that we could speak to you for, for a lot longer. And, and unfortunately, you know, there's only a certain amount of time and we can only go deep, you know, to a certain level. Um, but uh, one day we definitely want to, of course, have this in person, the three of us, yeah. and then have you again on the podcast uh, at some other time in the future. But before we finish off, um, a couple of things. Like, firstly, if people want to find out about you, uh, and just get in touch with you because you've been a great guy full of energy and they want to know a little bit more. Is there any way that uh, they can get hold of you like uh, social media or anything? Yeah, like that? sure. Listen, yeah. Instagram, I think is probably the easiest at the moment, right? Everyone's on it and it's, it's easy to, to make contact. So, uh, Ryan David Howell, H A W E L L, uh, same name on Facebook. Um, yeah, that would be cool. This was, Awesome, man. Cool. We put all the, we put like a whole lot of show notes and stuff together. So all your contact details will be in there. Um, but just the last question that we like to ask all of our guests is, um, you know, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? But for me, it's just loving, 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 dude. Love everything you do. Love everyone you come into contact with. Don't judge and just, just go, mate. Just Surrender yourself and love. And that's it. That's cool. it. Life becomes so much easier when you can do that. Totally. Oh, yeah, totally. Right. I love that, man. Yeah. That, that's like Wim Hof. I mean, I'm not, I'm sure you're familiar of, of the guy Wim Hof. That's all. He's like, he's all about love. He's like, you just got to love, man. Like, that's what the <laughs> world's about. I love He's such a good actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think we all know this, right? I think we yeah. all feel it. We, we know it, but it's, yeah, but it just somehow life wraps you up there. It wraps you up and it, like, you know, you take 
And, uh, but yeah, if you can just release yourself and just get it and, and get excited about stuff, right? So when you love mm-hmm. stuff, you just show your inner excitement, but it's, it's good to giggle about things. And it's good to like, you know, pump your body up and your mind and show yeah. people that you're excited about stuff. Exactly. It makes, right. it makes you feel so good, right? Yeah. Why would you want to live your entire life feeling good? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly, yeah. right. Yeah, like why not? You're so right. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and L- love and people, excitement. Yeah. Wow. And it makes people gravitate towards you, you know. Um, yeah. People don't get it. They're like, oh, why has Ryan always got like so many people around him and mates and flipping stuff like that? It's like, well, it's because he's flipping a good oak. He's just got good energy. And, you know, like people just like that because maybe it's not that, uh, that common about, around other people. So, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's a yeah. cool one, man. Yeah. Guys, thank you so yeah. much for having me on board. Honestly, what a, what a treat and, and what an honor. Thank you so much for, for having me. And it's been great to see both of you. And uh, I wish you the best of luck and many blessings in your endeavors. And I'm sure this is, this is just the beginning of, of many amazing things that you guys will do. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Very kind. And, cool and so, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, so, so basically, we always just like um, end off with just saying thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, and, and for me, it's an extra special one, you know, of course, because uh, we, we go back um, – years and years and years like and um i i was thinking about this before we you know you came on the podcast like talking about law of attraction our mothers went to high school together and we became mates and and they didn't know of each other like for a long time after their high school so um you've been such a big part of my life and such a big influence in my life i've always like admired you and looked looked up to you for just the, the person you are um, and, and the sort of knowledge you share and the way you connect people and the smile you have on your face and the energy and the positivity. And, you. you know, this chat has just been all of that. And you must just keep being such an amazing oak. Um, I, I cherish all the memories we've had and all the trips we've been on. And yes, we've had such a great time together. Um, but also thank you for sharing your story because there's been a lot of things in here that, you know, I, I didn't know. And it's, it's nice to know that stuff. It's nice to go that extra bit deep with your mates. That's for sure. Um, for I think sure. it's super important. So thank you, buddy. Um, it's been a great chat um, and I love you lots. And thanks for coming on the podcast, bud. Oh, love you too, guys. Thank you so much, bud. Appreciate it. And just, just real briefly from my side, it's just been so cool to see you guys. Good energy together as well. Good mates. You know, that's always so much fun to see you when there's just a good mateship, you know what I mean? And just good buddies. And, uh, and I'm honored to have met, uh, you as well now, you know, this is the cool thing Gareth and I were talking about this the other day is just, you know, the, the people you meet on the journey and, um, the network that you get through, through just speaking to good people is, is so valuable. And, um, you know, like uh, someone like yourself, you spoke about energy, and as you came on before we started the chat, even I was like instantly, wow, this guy's got great energy, you know, like, and that's kind of what you portray, but it's just naturally you as well. And, and, um, honestly, like it's just such a good reminder. So thanks for those like real nuggets of like, of reminders as well. Like life can be good. You can, you can change, you just bring good energy, listen more, like all these such important things. And, and you totally like uh, embody that. So just thanks for that, bud. And, and thanks for an epic chat. And yes, I can't wait to come and uh, have, have a trip with Gareth and come check you in Miami, man. That'll be Amazing, epic. So. Bud. Amazing. Well, 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 Craig, Craig, we fl- <laughs> yeah, go Craig, well, the thing is, but as soon as we uh, get accepted for podcast movements uh, to talk this year, then uh, that's in all exactly, that. But so we'll have to du- just we'll have to duck go over but. highway. Yeah, 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 have to, for way. sure. I think so, yeah. but yeah, that's epic. Yeah, well, there we go. Let's put it out there. Portuguese trip. I mean, guys got his farm and Australia. Yeah, yeah. There we go, buddy. We sorted. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, my man. Cool. Oh, so how how nice. did you did you enjoy it, my man? It wasn't nerve wracking, eh? What fun, man! Hey? So honestly, dude, like conversation is just the best thing. I can see why you guys like got excited about doing this and starting this because yeah. isn't it the best way to, for human beings? So like about it. But it's yes, amazing. It's lacking, man. We've learned so, so much. Good, right? Can't explain, but it's insane. yeah. Yes, I wish I had my notebook. I always think like during our chats, like, yeah. I want to be taking notes the whole time as well you know but yeah, obviously yeah. we get to listen to it again but it's like yes i, I don't want to forget that I don't want to forget that you know like it's so cool but thanks man you yeah. were yeah, 
epic today. Yeah. Well done. Okay, man. Awesome. 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 Yeah, awesome. Cool. Um, cool, man. All right, back guys. So yeah, another yeah. half an hour, I'll send you all the what you need. Sweet. Okay, so no worries. And, um what time Craig, it must be there early morning. It's morning, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we, yeah, if you can send that over, that'd be kiff because then I can um get cracking on the edit for for Wednesday and so that yeah, that'll be Sunday. This is how it works, my man. I haven't heard somebody use the word kiff in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's so refreshing to just South African uh, voice right. accent. <laughs> Nothing better. What a cool there's so many lack of words in South Africa. I've just been back. I suppose it's ref- giving me a refresher, you know. <laughs> Classic. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change.